Well, hello and welcome back to Grace Life London, live streaming again from my study. Um, I want to speak to you today about uh, how uh, to find God in a crisis and specifically um, what you have to do to be saved. What must I do to be saved? Nothing could be more urgent for us at the moment. Um, this last week, um, another family in our church has been bereaved and they're grieving. They lost both their father and their mother in uh, the space of two days. You could be praying for Emmanuel, um, for Louisa, Ulysses, Mariam, and the rest of the family who are, are grieving at this time. And we, we are grieving with those who are grieving and, um, you know, it is, has just reminded me of the urgency of, of speaking to you very directly about what we must do to be saved. Over the recent weeks in this series of sermons on uh, finding God in a crisis, I've tried to focus on, on, on salvation itself and, and tried to differentiate um, try to distinguish what, what salvation really is from the very common misconceptions that are out there. And I'm not going to go over all of that to begin with today. I just want to zoom in today on one verse in the book of Romans that I believe just nails it for us. Paul in the book of Romans frequently summarizes the whole um essence of the message of the gospel and the good news of the Bible, but also the, the, the essence of what it means to become a Christian, what it, what it takes to actually receive this salvation that is available, the forgiveness that's available through Christ. And uh, I want you to turn back to the book of Romans, Romans again, and this time to chapter 10. And, and verse 9, which I believe nails the issue, this is a, a really compact and wonderful summary of what you have to do to be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, which says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. That's my prayer. That's what I'm longing for today uh, will be the outcome of this message, uh, perhaps in your life or the lives of those that we, we know and love and the lives of, lives of people that we're reaching out to uh, with this good news. So may the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to again ask you that you would help me by the power of your Holy Spirit to explain straightforwardly what is contained in this verse. Such a, a wonderful summary of what we must do to be saved. I pray that you would uh, give me words and uh, enable me to make it clear and um, please enable all who hear to know this salvation, to know it for ourselves, to know it for real, and we pray that we would know it, and those that we love would know it before it's too late for them. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, if uh, you're taking notes, um, I'm going to be tackling the verse very straightforwardly again this morning. First of all, I want to talk to you about the confession that you must make and then secondly, about the belief you must have. And thirdly, about the salvation that you will receive. Um, that's the order we get from the text in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's the confession that you have to make, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's the belief that you need to have, and you will be saved is the promise at the end. That's the salvation that you will receive according to this verse. 
And as always, um, I want you to have your Bible open. If you don't already have it open, grab it, open it up to Romans 10, 9. Find your way there in the uh, electronic Bible that you have, perhaps, because uh, at the end, I, I want to try to relate this verse to its context. We're going to go back through Romans chapter 9, because the, the, the verse itself begins with the word because, and that links it back to the context. I want to show you from the context just what this salvation that we're talking about um, entails, um, set out really in the context. But because I've spent so much time on that in recent weeks, I want to zoom in today on what you have to do to be saved, and then we'll back up at the end and talk about salvation again. So if you're with me, uh, let's talk first about the confession that you must make. If you confess with your mouth, it says here, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Look, um, I'm going to be pointing out the obvious today. Um, people gloss over this verse all the time. And, you know, people use this verse glibly in a way that m makes it mean almost nothing. Actually, I'm going to say that you have to make a public confession, a statement of allegiance and submission to Jesus Christ as Lord. And, and that's counting the cost of what it means to be his follower, and that you actually literally have to do this verbally, personally, publicly, otherwise you won't be saved. That's, I believe, what this verse teaches. Let me unpack it, but let's start with this idea of confession. Obviously, what we're talking about here, uh, when we use the term confession, is not confession of sin. Um, we're talking about confession of truth, and yet the if you're taking notes, um, you could write a subheading here, a subpoint, uh, the nature of confession, because that's what I want to talk about first. What what, what is actually meant when it says we have to confess Jesus as Lord or Jesus is Lord? Well, the Greek word that is used um, and translated as confess is, is the verb homologeo. Um, it's, it's actually, if we translated it very literally from it, the parts of the word, it, it, would, it would come out as I say the same thing. <laughs> I say the same. And, and it basically, the idea in the word is the idea of uh, saying, I, I agree. Um, it, in the case of confessing our sins, of course, um, we're saying, well, look, God, God or, or someone else perhaps is saying to us, that's, that's sinful, that's wrong, that's evil. And, and if we confess our sins, we're saying, I say the same. I, I, I agree that that is wrong. I agree that I am a sinner. I agree that I have sinned. And that's, that's confession. We're, we're saying God is right to say the things about me are wrong, are evil, uh, that I'm a sinner. Uh, so if that's what we're doing when we confess our sins, we're speaking out that agreement, in, inner agreement, either to God or to men, um, now, this context, we're not talking about confessing sins, but it carries the same basic meaning. I, I, I want to explain that the word, however, became used regularly um, for acknowledging something that someone else said that was also true, not just, not just acknowledging sins, um, but acknowledging a statement that was someone else had made that was true. Um, in our context, if our queen died uh, and someone said, well, let's forget Charles, William is king. Um, if you wanted to express your agreement with that statement, <laughs> um, you could make that your confession. That would be your, your, your public profession of agreement that William is king or ought to be king. Now, the, the the dictionary definition that, that I used, um, the Greek dictionary that I used, had this, this definition, I quote, to acknowledge something 
ordinarily in public. Uh, some, sometimes the, the word is translated as to profess. And, and obviously, if the claim that you are acknowledging in public is somebody's claim to be king, then it becomes a profession of allegiance to that king. It becomes a statement, I agree that so-and-so is king. Actually, the dictionary I use, the I think it's the best Greek dictionary available, BDAG as we call it, um, gives many examples in, in the New Testament of this word's use as a profession of allegiance. For example, in John chapter 9, when um, Jesus healed a blind man, and the Pharisees didn't like it at all. And they kept asking his questions, parent, they kept asking his parents questions about the blind man. And in, in, the, in the end, the blind man's parents were trying to get out of an awkward situation. And they said, look, he is of age, ask him. And, and John gives us the explanation of um, what they were saying there in, in chapter 9 and verse 22. And John says this, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that, now listen, if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. That's the same word. And used in this sense of making a public acknowledgement even, a, a, an admittance that, yes, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Now, because of the pressure from the Jews who were, who were saying that if anyone acknowledged, if anyone confessed that Jesus is the Christ, they're going to be put out of the synagogue, uh, there were lots of people who secretly believed that Jesus was actually the Messiah but they weren't willing to make that public profession, the public confession of allegiance and faith in Jesus. John chapter 12 gives us a painful example of this. It says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, the rulers, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Now, there's the same word again. They, they wouldn't confess it. Why? It says, it says here in John chapter 12, verse 42, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. So what I'm the point I'm trying to make here is that what it means to confess Jesus is, is actually to acknowledge him publicly, to, to profess him as Lord publicly, to profess your allegiance to him publicly. And, and, and so you could say it, it means the opposite of denying him or, or refusing to be, be associated with him. In fact, that's exactly how Jesus used this same term, uh, if, you, if you look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, uh, verse 32, Jesus said, so, so anyone, or everyone, sorry, who acknowledges me, there it's translated acknowledge in, in the ESV, but it's the same word, homologeo, anyone, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge, same word, homologeo, before my Father in heaven. Those are the words of Jesus. But in the next verse, he contrasts confessing or acknowledging or professing allegiance to him. He contrasts that with denying him. Verse 33, Matthew 10, verse 33. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now look, um, what I'm trying to say is all that meaning, and that's a lot of meaning, isn't it? But all that meaning is bound up in one simple thought here, 
and it's the idea that you, you must confess Christ. That means you have to make what amounts to a public profession of your allegiance to him, your loyalty to him, your devotion to Christ. Uh, and and there's this is not you in a room somewhere um, on your own saying the words, Jesus is Lord, as some kind of magic formula. People have, people have abused this verse terribly. They've spoken like I'm speaking now into the television cameras and, uh, and said, if you will just say the words, Jesus is Lord, and, and, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Never let anyone deny it. Hold on a moment. There's a lot more bound up in the idea of you confessing Christ than just saying the words. And, and we'll see that more, more uh, evidently, more clearly in, in a few moments. Now, just as a side note, though, <laughs> listen. Um, if you confess Jesus as Lord before men, before people, what a thought that Jesus promised that he will confess you before his Father in heaven. That, 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 that's quite a thought, that if you express your loyalty to him um, and your allegiance to him publicly, no matter what the cost is, you, you come out as a Christian, as his follower, he will own you. Now think about that. This is, you can think about the promise to the believers in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. Um, Jesus said this to the one who conquers, will, the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments, but, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will, now listen, confess his name before my father and before his angels. <laughs> So you confess your loyalty and your devotion to Jesus in this life. And wow, Jesus will spell out his commitment and his attachment to you before the Father and, and before his angels. <laughs> That's quite something. But we're talking about confessing um, confessing. Christ, we're talking about confessing Jesus as Lord, and, and as we're talking about this idea of confessing um, the name of, of Jesus, um, I, I want to think about the, what it means now that, um, th that we do confess Jesus as Lord. I'm going to be talking now, secondly, as a subheading in this first point, uh, about the content of the confession. And the content of the confession, of course, is, is that Jesus is Lord. Uh, now, we've already seen a lot of meaning implied in the, the idea of confession itself, but um, wow, there's a, there's a whole world of meaning implied, yeah. inherent, built into the idea that Jesus is Lord, to say those words and to understand them and mean them um, is no light thing. Think of this, that what you're doing when you say Jesus is Lord is you're, you're expressing verbally, publicly, counting the cost, you're expressing a recognition of his sovereignty, his primacy, even his deity. Let's talk about those. Um, the recognition of his sovereignty. The, the fact basically is that when you say someone's Lord, you're saying, aren't you, that they are um, the master, you would say. And, and, and basically we're, we're saying that, that they're the one in charge. They're the one who is in authority. When, when the New Testament disciples confessed Jesus as Lord, they absolutely understood that they were, they were saying Jesus is the person in authority in the entire universe. 
over the entire universe. In fact, Jesus himself, Matthew 28, verse 18, this is the Great Commission. Jesus himself says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is, <laughs> this is Jesus about to commission his disciples to go and preach the gospel throughout the world and to make disciples of every nation and so on. But in doing so, <laughs> there's this statement, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That places Jesus in control of literally everything. He is the one Lord, the one master. So they weren't kidding when they, when they said Lord. They, weren't, they were saying that Jesus is actually ultimately in charge. But as well as recognizing his sovereignty, um, they, they were also recognizing what I'm calling his primacy. That means that, that there can only be one Lord, one Lord of Lords, one ultimate authority. Now, uh, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is described in that way. It's, it's said that's written on the written on his um, the hem of his uh, coat is is King of Kings and Lord of Lords as a title. Uh, and, and listen to this. This is how Paul. Um, speaks about Jesus in the book of Philippians, Philippians 1 and, and verses 9 to 11. Um, Paul says, God has highly exalted him, speaking about Jesus, and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So, so that, verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, uh, w w what I'm saying here is that if you confess Jesus is Lord, it, it means acknowledging him uh, to be the Lord of Lords. And, and you know that there's always been a cost to doing that, don't you? You know that, that because you know that there are many authority structures in this world and, and that people who are above you in authority, who are your earthly master or earthly lord, don't always take kindly to rivals. Caesar is Lord was a statement that was made publicly and actually in the end it was put to Christians as a, an ultimatum. Declare Caesar is Lord. Just, just admit that Christ is not Lord and you can live. But you go, you go on saying Jesus is Lord and you will die. And, and that was how Christians were interrogated and then executed for their faith in the earliest days of the church. Because, uh, you know, people in this world don't take kindly to rival authorities. But when we confess Jesus as Lord, we, we, we are saying he's over them. He, we are saying that the allegiance that we owe, the, the devotion that we show, the, the loyalty that we have is primarily to him. And, and, and so I'm saying that we're confessing not only his sovereignty, but also his primacy. Um, and, and also we're acknowledging, thirdly, his deity. Um, his deity is, is also bound up in the title Lord and the use of that title by Christians in the New Testament. Let me explain. Um, yes, the word kurios, a Greek word, can mean just master um, in, a, in a human sense, as in my, my master, I'm the slave, you're, you're my master. Or um, you might use that as a term of respect in the New Testament, just like 
saying to, to someone, sir, um, but when it's used, um, you would say, carefully and deliberately as a title, it's very different to that, and the New Testament disciples understood that perfectly. T- Thomas, um, when he finally ended his doubting, and Jesus said, put your hand here, see my hands and my feet, it's me. And when Thomas realized that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead, he worshipped and he said, my Lord and my God. And and those ideas came together, you could say, in Thomas's mind, I'm sure, at that moment, because for the maybe for the first time ever, it was confirmed to Thomas that Jesus was indeed God, deity. This is how John describes him in the beginning of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We're talking about Jesus as the Son of God, but God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. This is this is the divine nature of Jesus, so that Jesus could say to the Jews who were accusing him in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. And use that, that Old Testament name of God for himself. And the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. They, they picked up stones to stone him. And, and, and again and again, Jesus is painted in the New Testament very clearly as being divine. And and the New Testament use of this term, kurios, Lord, applied to Jesus, it meant that he was sovereign. It meant that he was was in first place overall, but it also meant that he was divine. he, He is the Lord God. And and, and that's who we are professing him to be. You know, in the New Testament, um, oftentimes Old Testament scriptures are quoted, which in the Old Testament context, you find they're speaking about God, and yet they're quoted in reference to Jesus. An example of that, Isaiah um, 40 verse 3 speaks about um, preparing the way of the Lord in the wilderness and making a uh, making straight the, in the desert a highway for our God. And, and yet along comes John the Baptist in the New Testament, and along come the New Testament writers, and they take that word, Lord, which if you go back to the Old Testament, it's Yahweh. It's, it, it's, the, it's the unpronounceable name of God, <laughs> the, the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, or um, sometimes translated as Jehovah or Yahweh, and and in our English Bibles, mostly um, translated as capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord. This is God, the personal name, the I am name of God, and it, it's applied by the New Testament writers to Jesus. And the word they use is kurios. And so John the Baptist is speaking about preparing the way of the Lord, and he's talking about Jesus. <laughs> and, well, what, what, what's happening in the New Testament? Well, what's happening in the New Testament is a revelation, and, and an increased revelation of what was present in the Old Testament, but not so clear, increasing clarity on the reality that God is a plurality (laughs) and that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we're talking about Jesus as Lord, we're saying Jesus is God, the Son. And so um, I want to just back up and say, look, we're, we're... we're first of all saying we're going to recognize in, in, de- in declaring Jesus is Lord, in making a public profession, a confession, Jesus is Lord. 
you're saying, I, I acknowledge, I recognize his sovereignty, his primacy, and his deity. That's bound up in that title, Lord. But implicit in stating Jesus is Lord is also your own submission to him as Lord. Can, can I put it like this? It, it, it means that you are saying Jesus is my Lord because you are publicly making that statement. You're declaring with that statement your own submission to him as Lord. Otherwise, you're, you're just declaring yourself to be a rebel. <laughs> You, you, it would be no comfort um, to you, I'm sure, to say, yes, Jesus is Lord, but I'm not his servant. <laughs> I'm not his slave. Actually, you're implying in the statement, the confession is one of allegiance. It's one of submission. It's one of stating your own position as a servant, a slave. He's your master. He's your Lord. You're his slave. You're his servant. You're his disciple. He is your teacher. And, 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 and these are the words that the New Testament uses of Christians. Doulos, slave. Um, Mathetes, disciple, follower, learner. So he's the Lord. He's the master. We're, we're the slaves, we're the servants, we're the, t we're, we're the learners, we're the disciples. And I, I want to um, really just pause for a minute and, and ask you to think about that. Would you, would you come with me to Luke chapter 9? Um, Luke chapter 9 and, and um, the, these are the... Words of the Lord Jesus in 23, Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Jesus said this, um, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. But what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Now listen, Jesus has just talked about denying yourself so many people would say that they are their own master. Jesus has talked about denying yourself and taking up your cross. That's an instrument of torture and death. Taking up that cross daily and following him as your, following him as your master. So he's talking about submission to him and, 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 and you would say becoming his follower and then he says this, verse 26, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now, now um, if you want to get some more on this, let's just keep this going. Shall we go back to Matthew chapter 10? Matthew Chapter 10, and Jesus, in that same context of calling people to consider uh, the cost, to count the cost of being his follower, rather than just simply declaring themselves to be his follower without, without actually meaning it. In that context, he's reassuring people in Matthew chapter 10, um, saying, look, persecution's coming, but, but don't be afraid of them. Matthew 10, 26, have no fear of them, for nothing 
co is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in, in hell. And so he's encouraging them to, to commit themselves to God and to, to fear God, and, but to trust God. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But, but even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now listen, in the background of preparing people by saying, come on, you, you mustn't fear being killed but fear the one who can send you to hell. I'm going to look after you, says, says Jesus. God, God will look after you, says Jesus. And then he says in verse 32, so everyone who acknowledges me, and that's our word, confesses, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me, listen, is not worthy of me. I'm saying all of that because when you declare publicly that Jesus is Lord, you are declaring publicly that he is your master. But he has declared publicly that unless you're willing to, to submit yourself to him, to, to have him as Lord of all, to have him as a greater authority, the highest authority, even than, let's say, the members of your own household, and let's face it, the hardest people to say no to are the people in our own household who will perhaps hate us refusing to submit to them over and above submitting to God. To take up your cross daily, to be willing to die daily for the sake of your master is part of the confession, and yet if you're not willing to make that, Jesus says you're not worthy to be his disciple. You cannot be his disciple. And that's why I say when you declare Jesus is Lord, you're declaring your submission to him. And, and let, let me just wrap this section up very briefly. I, I've taken too long already, but look, I'm going to say it has to be a literal profession. It says, with your mouth, <laughs> whoever... Uh, will confess with his mouth. Sorry, but um, if you will confess, because if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. It, it does say with your mouth for a reason, and I, I, I'm guessing that means because you're supposed to actually speak the words. Uh, let, let, let's not spiritualize that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about Exceptions a great deal. Of course, if you didn't have a mouth, I'm guessing the Lord would accept a pen. Or uh, if you typed it in your nose or wrote it with your finger in your own blood, if you couldn't speak. Look, the point is that you're, this is speaking about an act of confession, an act of profession. And I'm going to say it's a literal act of 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 speaking out, and we've dealt with the fact that it's publicly. Um, can I just say some of you need to get over your fear? Are, are you really going to say you're prepared to lay, lay down your life and take up your cross and follow Jesus, but you're not prepared to stand in front of a few people and actually say the words, I 
am a follower of Jesus. I mean, Jesus is Lord. Is that too hard to say? For what Jesus says is, what the Bible says here is that you must confess with your mouth. And, and, and it needs, needs to be before men. It needs to be before people. It needs to be a public, open statement of your allegiance. And, and so I'm going to say to you again, to those of you who like some in the authorities in Jesus' time, who were unwilling to make that confession because of fear, I'm going to say to you, come out, come out, come out of hiding. Take the plunge, make the profession. This is a personal profession, by the way. In the Greek, the the you here is singular. We don't have a difference in English between a a plural you, the spelling, and, and a singular you. But in Greek, it's obvious. This is speaking not to you in general, not to you and your household. This is There's no such thing as a household profession of faith. This is speaking to you. You have to make your confession. You and you alone. And I, I must say something here. I was christened as a child. And people, I guess, sprinkled some water on my head and said, I and to, and said about me as a baby, he is a, now a Christian. And nothing could have been further from the truth. I, I had a God father who, if he did, make the vows in the Church of England that accompany a christening. Um, he, and I'm quoting the Church of England website now, and I know it's changed and been updated, but the basic the basic idea has been the same down through even the centuries. Um, this is this is the idea written in the Church of England website, and I quote: "You will then be asked some questions, which you answer on behalf of the child, who is too young to answer for themselves." Now, listen. This is what they say: "You will be asked to turn away from all things that are against God." the wrong in our own lives, and to stand against the wrong in the world. This is spoken to godparents. You will then be asked to turn positively towards Jesus, the companion and guide for the amazing journey ahead. Well, they managed to market that one so well, didn't they, that they kind of wrote out taking up your cross (laughs) from the whole deal. (laughs) Amazing journey ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, Confessing Jesus as Lord. It needs to be a profession of submission, a profession of allegiance. But it needs to be a personal one, doesn't it? No parents can do this for you. There's no such thing as as a, as a, a substitute making a making a profession for you. You can have someone else read your statement if you're so terrified that you cannot get the words out, but you have to get the words out. They have to be your words. It has to be your profession. And I'm going to say, look, you cannot be saved if you won't make this profession of faith, if you won't make this confession this is this is you could say one if you've been passed if you're standing on a on a on a the top of a burning building and up comes the superhero and there's a there's a zip line created and the, and and you're given a bar to hold this is one hand with which you have to hold the bar that takes you to safety and it's the hand of confession now let's talk about belief Let's talk about belief. And this will be much more brief. It's so simple. Um, There's a word and, which means that there's a second hand (laughs) with which you have to hold the bar that takes you to safety. And the the second half of the whole deal, you could say, is believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Confessing with your mouth, but believing in your heart. 
that God raised him from the dead. I, I don't think I need to go back over the whole concept of God raising Jesus from the dead. That's, that's a very well-explained phenomena, and we've been over it just recently um, at Easter time. The, the idea very simply is that Jesus was crucified. He was buried. Uh, he, he actually died. He was buried, and three days later, he was raised from the dead, and we're told here that you have to believe that in your heart. Now, many people will immediately say, well, yes, um, I, 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 I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. There's, there's no problem there. But do you believe that? Do, do, you, do you really believe that? Can I ask you to stop and consider what difference that belief has made to you? I'm going to say, if you come back to the New Testament and you ask the question, what difference did the belief in the resurrection make to people? What actually changed when people really believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead? I I think you'll find um, that this belief is revolutionary. It's a belief in the resurrection that changes everything about a person, if you really believe it. And I'm going to say believe in your heart. There, there is a difference, isn't there, between an intellectual belief and a and a, what we would call a heart belief. And I think that's what's being pointed to here. They Actually, the, the, um, the belief in the facts of the resurrection um, were never separated out in, in the New Testament from a, as, as a kind of an intellectual belief or a, a heart belief. But there's a, there's a, there, there is in the New Testament of the reality of a belief which does not submit and a belief which involves a submission. We're told that in James 2.19, we're told that the devils believe and tremble. The devils believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. They know it for a fact, but they don't submit. They tremble. They they, they recoil from, from the reality. And, and, and so obviously there, there, it is possible to have a, a belief of a kind that doesn't actually result in a change in, in your heart, a change in your attitude towards God. But I'm talking here about a belief, you could say, with the whole of you. The heart in the Bible is, it, it speaks about, yes, the intellect, but it speaks about the emotions, it talks about the will, um, it encompasses everything. It's basically saying the, the, the real you, the whole of you, do you as a, an entirety actually believe? And, and so I don't think it's wrong for us to say, to contrast this with just a mere intellectual assent to the the fact of the resurrection. Why do I make that distinction? Well, um, there are a lot of people who who would come to this point and say, yes, I, I believe Jesus was raised from the dead. But that belief has never really changed anything in them. It's never really got hold of them. And I'm going to say, well, you may believe it with your head, but you're not believing it in your heart. And what you need is to to have a belief about the resurrection that that takes hold of you, that that grips you, that changes you. (laughs) And and that's the description that we're given here, believing in your heart. I, I think to illustrate what that belief is like, we just have to go back to the the New Testament, if you follow with me to the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, um, when the Lord was appearing to the disciples, we've already talked about the reality that when he appeared to Thomas, Thomas didn't, uh, Thomas was finally convinced and um, bowed and and worshipped and said, my Lord and my God, you could say at that moment, Thomas believed in his heart that the Lord was raised from the dead. But there there is the reality that when um, Jesus appeared to people, he didn't 
uh, they weren't all always convinced. Um, Matthew 28, verse 16, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. Now that's the same response as, as Thomas. There, there are people who, when they see the risen Jesus, are responding by inwardly bowing to him and worshipping him. By the way, worship in the Bible is only ever reserved for God. They're recognizing his deity. They're bowing and worshipping Jesus. But it says, but some doubted. But some doubted. We're talking about the reality that they're seeing the risen Jesus, but they can't take it all in. They can't process it all and they can't conceive of this is really God. Now, um, I want to contrast that if you go to the end of Luke. uh, And Luke chapter 24. And when they, this is after he had been appearing to them on and off for 40 days. Luke tells us in, in the book of Acts, as you begin the book of Acts, he'd been appearing to them and teaching them about the kingdom of God over 40 days. But then in, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 50, it talks about his ascension into heaven. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Now I want you to just picture the scene for a moment. There they are. They've been meeting with him for the last 40 days has been appearing here and appearing there, and they've been, he's been talking with them and teaching them. And this is the risen Lord Jesus. And they can't believe it. They can't take it in. They're, they're worshipping him, but some are doubting. And now they're here uh, on the Mount of Olives, as it turns out, and they're, they're talking to him, and he blesses them, and then they watch him going up, up, up into heaven. <laughs> What's their response at that point? They, 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 are, they, are they utterly convinced? Yes, they are utterly convinced that Jesus has been raised from the dead, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord. They are totally convinced that God has raised him from the dead. And it says in verse 52, and they worshipped him. There's no doubting now. There's no, there's no questioning going on. There's no confusion. There's simply worship. Now, I wonder if you've ever thought about the Lord Jesus Christ risen from the dead and, and believed it. Have you believed it in your heart? Have you got down on your face and worshipped him. Has it changed your heart so that you say, Jesus, you are God. And you deserve my worship. Have you prayed to Jesus, pouring out your adoration for him as the risen Lord Jesus Christ? That belief in Jesus that God raised him from the dead, that belief in the heart, changed the world. When 11 people, and and there was a a 12th added to their number again, but when those apostles really believed that Jesus had risen from the dead, they went everywhere preaching as witnesses of the resurrection, and the world was changed. The world was turned upside down, and, and all of them were willing to go to their deaths, testifying Jesus rose. But it wasn't just a, an intellectual ascent, was it? It was a, a heart transforming, a wholehearted allegiance, a wholehearted commitment to truth. This is, this is them saying, we believe He is raised from the dead. And I want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is raised from the dead?
Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Look, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the promise of this scripture is for you. You will be saved. It doesn't matter how wicked you've been, because his resurrection is the seal of God's approval on his sacrifice. His resurrection says the payment he made in his death was acceptable to God. All our sins can be removed by that atoning sacrifice. I said I'd go back through the context in Romans and I've run out of time. I just need to tell you, look at it for yourself. Paul's talking to the to the Roman church in, in, in verses 1 through 8 in, in uh, Romans chapter 10. Sorry, in verses 1 through 8 in Romans chapter 10, Paul's talking to them about the reality that the, his own people, the Jews, were pursuing a righteousness that comes from works and were not... They were trying to go around establishing a righteousness of their own in God's sight, but they were, they were not submitting to the righteousness that comes from God as a gift. Go back to Romans chapter 3. Righteousness as a gift. Justification to be declared right in God's eyes as a gift. They weren't submitting to that. but They were trying to go around establishing their own. And Paul has to say to them, don't think, it's not that you have to... Go up into heaven to, re- to, to receive this or descend into the depths. God doesn't want you to go on this great odyssey to find salvation. But the word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's, it's, it's a simple, simple word of, of salvation that is being preached to you. That The message of the Bible is coming to you. It's not that you've got to go on this great spiritual odyssey in order to in order to achieve salvation, or you have to have someone go and do something amazing to achieve it, it's been achieved at the cross. And and the message is simple. If you just confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. Now, I I need to point out as I close... um, it is it is a very personal thing, salvation. We're not talking about a group salvation here. Again, the you will be saved is, is singular. Um, it, it, it's a promise. It's guaranteed by God. You will be saved. But it's also passive. Um, it, this is a, a verb in the passive voice. It means this is something that will happen to you. What we're not talking about, and let me contrast this briefly with the illustration I gave earlier, what we're not talking about is you saving yourself by holding on to the bar on the zip wire and therefore you can congratulate yourself at the other side that I saved myself by my fine grip with both confession and belief. It's nothing of the sort. This is talking about you being saved, a better illustration perhaps would be to say you need to have both feet inside the lift that is going to carry you up to heaven. We're talking about the need for both things. You have to, you must confess Jesus as Lord and and you must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Both things must be true, but these are not two steps towards heaven. This is both feet inside the lift. Uh, you can't, you, you know, if you leave one foot outside, um, it, it's going to be a disaster. Um, I, I better say this is urgent, isn't it? Um, I read an article the other day in the New York Times. Um, it had the. It had the heading, you know, what you need to know before you're put on a ventilator. And the article was really just trying to persuade people to make end-of-life care choices ahead of time before they found themselves 
uh, in um, accident and emergency. You know, the terrible thing about this virus is that um, it, it can affect people very suddenly. You can go from being ill and thinking you're getting better, and then suddenly there's this immune reaction, and you find yourself struggling for breath and rushed into hospital. Um, and that can all happen very quickly. The reality is that when you go into hospital, if you need to be put onto a ventilator in intensive care, you, you are also put into an induced coma. And that means that very quickly you can be literally put to sleep. And the, the tragedy is that from that sleep, many never awake. I, I, I think there's a, um, a tragedy in our country at the moment, and that is that people, people need an injection of seriousness about death, don't they? Um, I wish I could persuade people not to prepare, as the New York Times article is trying to get people to prepare, to make choices about whether to be resuscitated or not. And that, that obviously has its place to think through those things so that the doctors and nurses are not le left not, not knowing what your wishes are. But look, we, we need to prepare to, to be ready to die. I, I, and I don't think the answer is panic. Let me say that. I don't believe I don't believe personally that the solution to the pandemic is to panic. And I, I don't think um, I, I'm looking also at the mortality rates of this disease and, and saying, well, it doesn't look as though it's quite as deadly as they first feared. And I personally am thinking, well, maybe uh, there comes a time at which perhaps the number of people killed by the virus is going to be outweighed by the number of people killed if our economy completely collapses and first world medicine is no longer available to us. And, um, and hard choices, uh, I believe, will have to be made. Um, we're going to have to face the situation eventually where we uh, realize, perhaps, and unless there is a solution, that this is catch-22. That we have to live in a world where we can't escape the reality that this virus could, if it affects you badly, it could bring death to you and those you love. And it could bring it very suddenly. Um, we're living in an age that has tried to live as if that were not real. It's actually always been real. Death has always been something which could happen at any time. And so many young people live as if that just wasn't the case. But it is the case. You and those you love could die at any time. And I want to persuade you, I want to beg you as a pastor to prepare for that. To be ready for it. You don't want to be fighting for breath and heading to hospital and knowing that if they put you on a ventilator, you, you may go to sleep and never have the opportunity to do business with God, never have the opportunity to repent. You don't want to be doing that not ready. If you've never, if you've never made a public profession of your allegiance to and submission to and belief in Jesus as the Christ and as the Lord, if you've never done that, you need to do that. You need to do that. That's one of the things that you do when you get baptized, is you make that public profession. If you've never believed truly in your heart that he's risen from the dead, you need to reckon with that. You need to be persuaded. You need to look at those New Testament records and ask God to make it clear to your soul so that you can say, I believe, I believe, and that it fills your soul with joy and confidence and assurance, and so that people could say to you, we'll execute you if you don't deny it, and you'd say, okay, go ahead, because I can't deny that Jesus rose from the dead. That's belief in your heart. You need both. You need to have both feet inside the lift. 
You, you need to be both persuaded and professing. God bless you. Uh, and tonight we're going to be talking about more on the issue of blame shifting as a as a church and looking at how we respond to people who are blame shifters. So join us tonight, six o'clock. But until then, God bless you. Let me pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would please pour out your blessing and save those who are as yet unsaved and help us to make it clear to all that we know just what they must do to be saved. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.